so welcome to another session on um, what we're calling Be Brave. We're just walking through the Holy Week, the Passion Week, the last days of Jesus leading up to the crucifixion. Uh, we're, on, we're on Tuesday. Before we jump into the material, um, a, a new feature that I'm calling the koinonia question. So the, the word koinonia is used in the New Testament to talk about fellowship and community. And so this is, this is kind of an icebreaker question uh, designed for everyone to answer. And it, it also helps us get to know each other just a little bit more. And there is a relationship between this question and where we're headed today. So um, I'm not gonna share my screen yet because it's a little easier to see everybody this way. So today's coin and question, I'd, I'd love for everybody to answer this briefly, briefly. All right, here, here it is. You have to give a five minute how-to speech to a small group on a topic you know something about. What is the topic of your speech? You have to give a five minute how-to speech to a small group on a topic you know something about. What is the topic of your speech? Take just a few seconds to think about that. Can we go off recording? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll just do this popcorn style. What is the topic of your speech? Mm -hmm. This will resonate with just about everybody except you, Chris. How to load a moving van. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'm sure there's a story behind that. <laughs> there's several stories about it. We used to have what I call what I nicknamed the, uh, the, the relocation ministry. Aaron's a pro. <laughs> okay, very good. Someone uh -huh. else, what's the topic of your speech? Okay. Packing for a trip. <clears throat> what is that, Jane? Packing for a trip. Very good. <laughs> Training a puppy. <laughs> 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 and mostly what not to do oh. <laughs> by the way i'm going to spoil it for anna she could give us tips on how to drive a truck uh, the return of trucker mama <laughs> very good someone else what is the topic of your speech i'll go, say um i'll go uh the significance of using people's name in conversation oh very good yeah Thank you, Laconia. How to make a conversation interesting. Very good. Thank you. Make a paper airplane. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yes. So, what else? The house project approved by the Homeowners Association. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, Tony. Uh, Chris, mine is always the same. The the need for living wage jobs in, in America to, to keep the society from, from imploding. Okay, very good. Someone else, what's the topic of your speech? How to cross the street if you're blind. Oh, wow, okay, very good. Yeah, Julie? How to facilitate uh, streaming live on Switcher. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Scott did a great tutorial, but I, I mean, right now I feel like that's pretty fresh. <laughs> yep. <laughs> How to start a multi-center study in a pandemic. Oh, mm. wow. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Hmm. What? <laughs> Actually, I was kind of thinking, um, how to establish a rapport with a child you've never met before. Oh, very good. Yeah. Did I kill it? Your five minute speech, what will it be? Somebody talk? How to survive a condo board. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Very good. Craig? Well, I haven't figured out how to survive a condo board yet, even though I tried. Uh, maybe how to appreciate music, especially indigenous art forms such as jazz. Oh, nice. Very good. The key to surviving the condo board is to get off it. <laughs> uh, quick. One answer. page, one word, quick. Very good. I think I would uh, do a speech on how to create sermon slides. Yeah. <laughs> I'll attend. Slides. Anyone else? Five minute speech. What's your topic? How to perform an echo. How to perform <laughs> what? An echo. Ultrasound of the heart. Oh, very good. Yes. All right. I like that. Very interesting. Okay. Very good. Okay. Awesome. We know a little bit more about each other. And just, just think of the Zoom seminar that we could offer together. It'd be, it'd, be a, it'd be sold out. All these five minute speeches. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so we are on Tuesday of Passion Week. Uh, the focus here is uh, Jesus is challenged in terms of his teaching. He's challenged in his, in his teaching here. Mark 12, verse 13, uh, they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And so on, on Tuesday of Holy Week, Jesus spends much of his day giving speeches on hard topics to hostile audiences. And so uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking just in general about that challenge of speaking truth when it's not likely to be received well. And then uh, we'll, we'll look at three of the many uh, teachings that take place during this day on Holy Week. Um, no, no video today from Justin Taylor. I, I, I didn't find that one to be particularly helpful. Uh, we will listen to Amy Jo Levine, uh, just an overview of some of the teaching uh, here on Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus enters into the temple and he begins to teach. He's not the only one teaching in the temple. It's public space. Anybody can teach, but not everybody can hold the attention of the audience. And with Jesus' brilliant teaching, people come to listen. Not only his apostles, not only his disciples, but the pilgrim crowds as well. And we can imagine that the high priests are also listening. And while Jesus is teaching, people come and they try to challenge him as if they can come up with a question that will stump him or trap him. So some Pharisees come up and say, oh, we know you're a good teacher and you teach with wisdom. Tell us, they say, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? Mm -hmm. And some Sadducees, those who do not believe in the resurrection, come to Jesus and they say, tell us, there's a woman married to seven brothers. Whose wife is she? in the resurrection. And in a scene that I particularly appreciate, a scribe comes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And that's a terrific question because by tradition, there are 613 commandments. So you have to know which is the most important and which is the least important. And while Jesus is teaching in the temple, he also uses that as an occasion to teach others. He points to a poor widow who has only two coins, and she doesn't even hold one back, but she puts both into the temple treasury. And he uses her as a lesson, not only for the disciples who are watching, but for any reader of the gospel, even to this day. Some Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, 
Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? This is a trick question. It's what we would call an honor challenge. The Pharisees want to trip him up. If Jesus says in the temple, this public space with Roman soldiers as well as Jewish pilgrims listening in, no, don't pay your taxes, the Romans will arrest him on site for sedition. But if Jesus says, of course you pay your taxes to Rome, the people, particularly the Jews in the temple who think that Rome is in the country illegitimately, will say, oh, how can we possibly follow him? He's a Roman collaborationist. So if he says, yes, pay, or no, don't pay, either way, he's going to lose part of the crowd. So what he does do instead is he says to his interlocutors, show me a coin, which gives me the sense that he's not carrying any. And they show him a coin and he says, whose picture is on that coin? Well, it's the picture of Caesar. And we actually have these Roman coins and you can see the picture of Tiberius, the emperor. And then Jesus says, well, then you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and you give to God what belongs to God. Although most people today would say, well, that means, of course, you pay your taxes. Perhaps Jesus was being a little bit more subtle and turning the question back on the interlocutors. What, says Jesus, do you think belongs to God? And what do you think belongs to the emperor? You choose. That's a choice we have to make even to this day. Jesus and his followers are sitting in the temple and they notice people coming through and making donations, what we today would call free will offerings, dropping them into the temple treasury. And the people are paying from out of their abundance. They're not impoverishing themselves, but they notice suddenly a poor widow who has only two small coins. And instead of holding one back, she puts both of those coins into the temple treasury. The scene is sometimes called the widow's mite, a mite being a coin from the King James version of the translation. Jesus does not say, hey lady, save your money. He applauds her, but he makes the disciples pay attention. Do you see this woman? He says, and immediately we might think, do we overlook the poor? Do we pay attention to the rich and famous? rather than pay attention to the poor and humble. Do you see this woman? She has put in her whole life, which is how the Greek of the New Testament should be translated. That's exactly what Jesus will do in the Passion. He will give his whole life. And at the same time, the widow is showing trust because the temple was also a place where she knew she could find fellowship. She knew she could find support she knew she could find the bread on which she needed to live. And so we think to ourselves today, there's a poor person sitting in the back of the church, but that poor person too wants to contribute. How do we make sure that people's generosity is noticed? How do we make sure that we pay attention to what's in the individual's heart rather than simply how large the check happens to be? And how do we make sure that our houses of worship are places not only to which people can make donations, but places from which people can receive support? As Jesus is teaching in the temple, a scribe comes up to him and asks him, what is the greatest commandment? This was something actually Jews debated. Some people said, oh no, there were 10 great commandments, the 10 commandments. Some people cited the prophet Micah about working compassion, walking humbly with God and showing mercy. Some people cited the prophet Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith. And Paul was not the only Jew in the early years to cite that as the most important passage of the Bible. But Jesus says, actually, there are two great commandments and he would have responded in Hebrew. The first, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And he goes on, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Directly from Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is part of Judaism's daily liturgy. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha v'chal levavcha u'v'chal nafshecha u'v'chal me'odecha. I remember saying that when I was a little child and I repeated in the synagogue today. 
And to that he adds on Leviticus chapter 19, you will love your neighbor as yourself. The great Rabbi Akiva, another famous Jewish teacher put to death by the Roman authorities said, love your neighbor as yourself, that is the greatest commandment. And the scribe responds, yes, that's worth more than all sacrificial offerings. And Jesus was right and his fellow Jews would have agreed. When the Gospels introduced the group called the Sadducees, they frequently described them as the Sadducees, those who do not believe in resurrection of the dead. So I, on occasion, will tell my students, the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection of the dead, and that's what made them sad, you see. They were the outliers <laughs> at the time because pretty much all other Jews did. Because of the Pharisees and their teachings, resurrection of the dead became the dominant view. And by resurrection of the dead, ancient Jews were not talking about special ghosts floating around. They were actually talking about the reconstituted human body. It's not just a spirit that comes back. It's a body, a recognizable body as well. The Sadducees asked Jesus, what about this woman who through a system called leveret marriage is married to seven husbands? This is a practice probably no longer even being engaged in the first century, where if you were a wife and your husband died and you had not produced a child, you would marry your husband's brother and your husband's brother and you would conceive a child and that child would carry your dead husband's name and estate. We can see a hint of this actually in the book of Ruth. So here's this artificial circumstance where the woman has gone through seven brothers and then she finally dies. Whose wife is she in the resurrection? Asked the Sadducees. They don't care about the answer, but Jesus very much cares, not only about resurrection, Jesus cares about asking the right question. So he says to them, basically, you've got it wrong. You're thinking about God as being the God of the dead, but God is the God of the living. And we stop there and we pay attention to this idea of life. One ancient Jewish view was that when heavens come, when the kingdom of God breaks in, when the world to come is in place, we don't have to worry about being married or given in marriage because we are all like the angels of God. But I also like to think about this teaching and Jewish teaching in general, which in traditional Judaism still proclaims resurrection of the dead, that this is a time when you live not only with your children and your grandchildren and your friends and your neighbors, but it's a time you are also together with your parents and your great grandparents and your ancestors all the way back so that the family of God is complete, not only in terms of the people with whom we live today, but our families from the far past as well. And that's a perfected time. So uh, Jesus spends this uh, day largely teaching uh, often against a hostile audience. Uh, it reminded me of this quote from Brian McLaren. Uh, he says, all of us are poised between two dangers. The obvious one is the other. The subtle one is us. We gain a lot by attacking the other in religious circles as well as political ones. Ironically, us can be as great a threat to each of us as the other is, probably greater. Us might withdraw its approval of me. It might label me disloyal, unsupportive, unbeliever, or unorthodox, liberal, anathema, so on. To be rebuked, marginalized, or excluded by us is an even greater threat than to be attacked by the other. I don't think we Christians often realize the great degree to which we live in fear of us. And that is the primary fear that Jesus faces on uh, Tuesday of Holy Week not the fear of, of the other, which would be the Romans, but, but the fear of us, his, his own people, uh, the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders. Um, and so what we see uh, on this day is that fear does not fashion what Jesus teaches, that he speaks what love demands, not what safety desires. And that his topics emerge from his devotion to us rather than his dread of us. And that he provides what leads to transformation, even 
uh, if it leads him to trouble. And so there's, there's great courage here. And so as, as we look at some of these teachings, I, I just want to uh, encourage you to uh, reflect on what it means for you to speak the truth, uh, the, the impact of fear on you when it comes to speaking the truth, and the way in which you overcome that fear. So I, I want to invite you to let those two questions sort of be the undercurrent uh, as, as we look at some specific teachings here that um, the, the, the takeaway from today is not necessarily what exactly does Jesus teach here or here, but sort of the larger principle of how do we face this challenge uh, as well of, of speaking the truth when the truth is not always um, received. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll look briefly this morning at three of his teachings. Uh, these, these were all mentioned by uh, the video. Uh, she mentioned some other ones as well that we will not look at. So Mark chapter 12, beginning verse 14. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. You know you're in trouble if that's how the conversation starts, right? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. So again, just a briefly background, Amy Jill Levine um, saying, and in writing in her book, that Daenerys has the picture of the Emperor Tiberius on one side with the inscription in Latin that translates Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of the divine or, or deified Augustus. The other side was engraved with the depiction of a seated woman, probably Tiberius's wife, Julia, and the inscription in Latin translated high priest. And so here's a look at that coin, a silver denarius worth approximately one day's wages. So you have uh, Tiberius here and the, the uh, Latin engraving on the side here um, uh, referring to uh, deity or deification and uh, probably his wife right here and the language of, of high priest there. Okay, so let's, let's reflect on, on this uh, situation here, this circumstance Jesus finds himself in. Um, so these, these three questions for conversation. What risk or risks was Jesus taking as he did this teaching? What gave him the confidence to, st to stand by this challenge? And what risks might this teaching call us to take? So let's, let's reflect on that. What, what risk is Jesus taking as he engages in this question? on uh, Tuesday of Holy Week. You know, Chris, I think um, Amy uh, Jill summarized it very nicely with regard to how the Romans would feel about it and how the Jews would feel about it. And what I really love about how he handles this is my version in uh, Mark 12 says, but Jesus knew their hypocrisy and he, he just asked him flat out, why are you trying to trap me? He asked, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And then you know the rest of this, but I like so much what he does. He just calls it out for what it is. You know, he sees right through it. And, and also in my um, translation before that, they come and they try to butter him up. Oh, teacher, we know you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you know, you pay no attention to who they are but you teach the way of God in accordance with the way of truth. And then, you know, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? I mean, it is all so fake. And, you know, I'm at the point in my life too, where I see what people are doing, you know, when they come up to you and say things like that, and you just start uh, seeing right through it. And I think Jesus saw right through it immediately. And you can see his response, which is absolutely brilliant. 
Um, and the whole reaction of that was they were amazed at him. You know, they just cut. You know, they didn't want to engage in some kind of debate with Jesus. It, it all ended right there at that point for at least that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lois. Someone else, what, what do you feel like is the real risk that, that Jesus is taking as he engages in this conversation, this teaching? Yeah, Julie? To some extent, he's he's not going to give the right answer. He doesn't. He's not going to give the answer anyone wants to hear. <laughs> he's not going to become popular by this question. It, they are amazed because he somehow gets away from both of them, but he doesn't have the answer that either wants to hear. Thank you, Julie. I, I what uh, what Lois said about his brilliance resonates with me. Uh, Jesus is someone that you do not trifle with and you do not want to debate because he's smarter than you are and he'll make you look, he will expose you if, if you're trying to trip him up and you're not sincere. Uh, I think of this and uh, one way of looking at this, if you're as brilliant as he was, uh, he wasn't taking much of a risk because the answer that he gave was irrefutable. It, it, it broke all the conventions. It turned it back upon themselves and he's able to do this in real time. I mean, a lot of us can do this if we had a week to think about something and say, wow, if I did that, that would, well, he did this all the time. Mm -hmm. And you, you talk, you think about the woman, woman about to be stoned. And he probably looked at somebody who was an adulterer and wrote down, thou shalt not commit adultery in, in, you know, in, you know, in the sand and looked at somebody else and, and wrote something else down. And he was able to do that real time. And so uh, I think anybody that contended with Jesus either didn't know who he was or wouldn't do it a second time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really insightful. It, it is remarkable that he's able to do this, to um, walk this narrow way in the moment there. Because I, I definitely would have said, I, I'd like to get back to you on this. <laughs> This isn't only the only time he's challenged. This is just really the most public version. He's challenged all the time. You know, when him and his followers are hungry and they walk through the cornfield, he gets challenged when he leaves the cornfield. Isn't it unlawful to, to do work on the Sabbath? And he challenges the people who come after him. He's like, what's the real question you want to ask? Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting, isn't it? Um, and and this, this uh, well, as we consider some of the, times in which Jesus is challenged, there is almost a sense in which um, what, what is being sought after by the people around him are, are easy answers, uh, hard and fast answers, black and white answers. Should we pay taxes or not? Yes or no? And so often what Jesus does is refuse to uh, address what are ex extremely important issues, but he refuses to address them in uh, stark black and white uh, issues or, or easy, simple answers, right? In, in this case, uh, he, he in introduces an entirely new way of thinking about this very critical issue of, of God and country, of empire and faith, uh, when he says, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. People marveled at that teaching. Do you, do you see any risk in, in us adopting that teaching? Well, Chris, Jesus knew there was risk in his answers. He knew, who knew, he knew exactly what was going on. He knew what, how people would react to his answers. He knew there was risk, real risk, but he, did, he made the decision that he could afford to take that risk. Or perhaps it was his mission to take that risk and pay the price. And so in our lives, we face questions ourselves, but we're mortal, okay? And we, we still have to think, gee, can I really, am I willing to take on this risk? Can I afford that risk? 
what is ultimately going to happen as a result. And it's not an easy question to ask, ask to answer, but we face them all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. So like Jesus, we do face these um, moral uh, dilemmas, these questions where there seem to be two uh, tension points or two points held in tension, and we have to make determinations about them. Um, and so we, go ahead, Guy. I would say the difference between when Jesus is answering a question versus when we are answering a question, um, our answers are, tend to have to be, or needs to be right or needs to be justified or defending um, our position. It's always reflect our interest. Whereas Jesus is more, um, uh, Jesus, the, Jesus is not bound to this self-interest uh, uh, in entering this question. So that makes it even um, easier for him to come with us uh, uh, this kind of answer that are so effective in situations like that, because he's the truth. The truth is his guide, not his self interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and there is a sense here. Uh, I see Los. There is a sense here in which Jesus does offend everybody with his answer, even though they marvel at it, because in his answer he is saying. Uh, to those who would advocate and sort of an isolationist perspective from the pagan secular world or government, uh, he, he's saying there are things that belong to Caesar and those things should be rendered to him. On the other side, those that would advocate a, um, an, a close, intimate, almost nationalistic uh, relationship with the empire, Jesus is saying, well, but there are things that are God's alone and those things must be rendered uh, to him as well. Lois. You know, some scriptures that come to mind when I see that question, what gave Jesus the confidence to stand by this challenge? I thought of Proverbs 28, 1, where it says, the wicked man flees, though no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Hmm. And that's Christ. He was righteous. He was God. You know, he's perfect. And then, so how can that help us? And then I thought of Ephesians 6, uh, 10, where it says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And it talks about the full armor of God. Mm. And one of the things it mentions there is the breastplate of righteousness. And then all of you are familiar with the rest of the scriptures and all that. So it's, that's what we have to do. We have to align ourselves with God and put on all his mighty armor. And as my friend Velma always says, you always have to stay prayed up because it mentions at the end of here too, you always have to be praying and be prayed up because you really never know when a threat is going to come against you in this life. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very insightful. Thank you, Lois. All right. We're, we're just touching on uh, three of these scenarios here on, on Tuesday. I, I recognize we could take eight weeks on each of these teachings. So Mark 12, 28 and following, one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and that there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. So again, uh, as uh, the video uh, acknowledged, 613 commandments recognized in Jewish tradition in the scriptures of Israel, 365 negative commitments, don't do this, 248 positive commandments, do do this. Uh, the Talmud, collection of Jewish teaching that comes along shortly after the time of Jesus, 
provides a list of, of some of the, the attempts. And so this is a reflection of, of how these debates went about within the Jewish world to rank or, or summarize uh, scriptures, commandments. Uh, so some would use Psalm 15. There's, there's a list there of, of 11 commands that, that seem to be uh, a, a helpful summary. Some would use Isaiah 33, 15, where there's a mention of six commandments. Micah 6, 8 uh, seems to summarize biblical faith with, with three commands. And uh, Habakkuk 2, verse 4 seems to summarize it. And, and Paul grabs onto this later in the New Testament with this single command uh, to, to live by faith. So just just some sense of, of how uh, the Jewish tradition was um, rooting around in scripture to, to find these summaries uh, to the question of which one is the greatest commandment. Um, let me just go to these reflection questions here. So as, as we think about this scenario on Tuesday, what risk might Jesus be taking as he's engaged with this debate about what's most important in the Bible? Um, is it appropriate to prioritize certain texts or scriptures, or is everything equally important in the Bible? Uh, and what risks might be involved in, in our reading of the Bible through this, these two lenses of loving God and, and loving neighbor? Okay, so let's uh, share a little bit around that. Any of those three questions? You know, Chris, mm -hmm. um, when I see this, when I saw that list of rules and what are positive and what are negative and heard what Jamie, uh, Amy Jill uh, Levine said about it all, I thought to myself, what a nightmare for these people. And no wonder Jesus could say things to them like Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Um, take my yoke upon you and learn from me from gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I think what was going on here is people were so, uh, you know, obsessed with trying to keep the letter of the law. They completely forgot the spirit of the law as to what it really was all about. And it's having the right heart toward God. And so I think that's what Jesus was trying to say there. And, uh, you know, I don't know what some of the answers to the questions are about the prioritization of texts and scriptures. I think the most important thing is to try to keep it. Well, we don't have the law anymore. We have Jesus now, and he came to us full of grace and truth. But I think that's the focus right now is to have sort of the spirit of a law and to have that love in your heart. Thank you, Lois. Here's, here's, here's a proposal. Every single one of us and every religious group and congregation has their own version of the greatest commandments. And it is not always love God, love neighbor. How do you respond to that? Well, Chris, for, for me, that this is a simple question, and I, but I, I can, I can grant that not everybody could view it that way. But for me, there does need to be prioritization, or one risk, risk the uh, takes the risk of having missed the whole point of Scripture. Uh, and uh, when Jesus says something as explicitly as he says it, uh, that ought to settle the question uh, for a lot of people. Uh, for me, one reason that some things are more important than others uh, is <laughs> that, um, I'm sorry, some things are more important than others is that the Bible does <clears throat> contradict itself. It, it gives point and counterpoint to the point where you need to have some, uh, some lens to look at that through to say, which, you know, what's, what's the overriding issue that's more important than both of these things that makes them both, you know, have sense. Uh, and as, as anybody has worked with somebody new to scripture, um, they will come to you and say, show you things that seem to be very contradictory or even toxic. 
And you have to have a lens to say, well, listen, what's authoritative here uh, is the love of God, loving your neighbor, the ministry of Jesus and his example. And if that's questioned as not, you know, that this, this other thing that's being looked at is more important than that, um, then it's going to be a tough road to hoe. I'm speaking for myself. Uh, I've heard many, many people, especially on on radio, who say there are no contradictions in Scripture. Everything, everything is everything is completely uncontradictory. If you just maybe if you're smart enough uh, and educated, but that that isn't the case for me. I, I view prioritization as being essential. I wouldn't uh, uh, unduly uh, f- foist that on someone who disagrees. Jane. There's an Old Testament scholar by the name of James Sanders. Mm-hmm. He, he, may, he may be dead not by now, I don't know. But I used to read him a lot. And the bulk of his academic work had to do with the formation of canon. How did those ancient people choose particular texts particular letters that became for us, Jewish Christian community, authoritative in terms of what we believe and how we practice our faith. And I thought all that was very interesting and I appreciated it, but he took it a little bit further in terms of of personal, some of the things Tony was just saying. And the question I loved to hear him ask was, what's your canon? What's your canon? What is the text that forms your core beliefs that that shape how you live your life? And, you know, you just cannot answer that question with the Bible. It's too big. It's too, as Tony said, and I tend to agree, it's, there are too many internal contradictions but you know i could tell you in a couple of couple of sentences couple of verses kind of what i think my canon is but but what i really want to say is how much i agree with that insight of sanders that each of us whether we're able you know always to see it and identify it there are some core beliefs For most of us, I would guess they are scripture texts, but, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I don't think you can find those words per se in the Bible, but those are canon for a lot of people. Hmm. Those are the texts that shape who I am and direct how I at least try to live my life. And it seems to me that that's the question that, that we're wrestling with and and that's kind of my response is yes yes i have certain texts that are priority texts sanders would call it canon and i kind of like that term it's sort of 50 cent word you know in a in a 10 cent uh environment but anyway that's very um, helpful jane yeah um, i like that so kudos to james sanders be he living on earth or uh, among the saints. Thank you so much for that. Okay, I, I'm trying to uh, manage our time well, and, and it's about time for us to stop. So let me, let me just briefly share a little bit more content here. This quote from Rachel Held Evans uh, resonates with what Tony and Jane have said. For those who count the Bible as sacred, interpretation is not a matter of whether to pick and choose, but how to pick and choose. Yeah. We are all selective. We all wrestle with how to interpret and apply the Bible to our lives. We all go to the text looking for something, and we all have a tendency to find it. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Are we reading with the prejudice of love, or are we reading with the prejudices of judgments and power, self-interest, and greed? If you're looking for Bible verses with which to support slavery, you will find them. If you're looking for verses with which to abolish slavery, you will find them. If you're looking for verses with which to oppress women, you will find them. If you're looking for verses with which to liberate and honor women, you will find them. If you're looking for reasons to wage war, you will find them. If you're looking for reasons to promote peace, you will find them. If you're looking for an outdated, irrelevant ancient text, you will find it. If you're looking for truth, believe me, you will find it. And so this, this command, love God, love neighbor, it becomes the way to read the rest of scripture. Uh, 
you'll find these on my social media uh, today, but um, I've just done some reflecting on if love God, love neighbor truly are preeminent for us, if that's our canon, then it, it seems to me that there are a series of questions that we as individuals and we as, as, as churches should be asking ourselves. Um, and they're not the questions that typically get asked in churches. We tend to measure uh, other things as churches and Christians rather than measuring uh, love. Okay, uh, I, I feel constrained to stop us there. So there's time to transition into worship. So um, uh, these notes, including what we didn't cover, are on the church website. And so if you'd like to access them, please feel free to do so. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a sure. joy to be with you and hope to see you in worship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice class. Great class. Thank you. Thank you.